Hello and welcome to the Plague Whale Gala. Um, I am Laura Brody. I am a middle-aged white woman with brown hair, wearing a black top, sitting in front of a very full bookshelf, and I am living on Tongva land. The Plague Wear Gala has asked artists to make designs that ward off plagues of all kinds. Now, clothing that protects us from plague has a really long history, and we are still living in plague times right now. But many folks are tossing out their COVID protection masks, even though the disease continues to affect millions. People with low immunity and chronic illnesses are forced to hide away because the temporarily able-bodied people say we can't wear masks forever. This gala asks, why not? And why not make them fabulous? 14 artists came up with highly individual, amazing works of art and plagueware designs, and I am so excited to share them with you. Our very first artist is Amy Bauer. Garbage is the Plague, 2023. This is a fabric mumu with mixed media face shield. For this, we are seeing a person standing on a pile of driftwood in a sandy beach with palm trees in the background. They wear a clear face shield, white sunglasses, and a robe with white leaves on brown in front with striped blue, tan, and white uh, fabric in the back. This is a back view of the garment. Welcome, Amy. I'm a white woman with brown hair pulled back wearing reading glasses, a blue shirt with black and white sleeves, a green necklace with rainbow earrings, and I'm on Tongva land. I'm a lifelong maker, an artist, a designer, an art show producer, and educator. My work has been seen in the Brooklyn Art Library, the Autry at LAX Airport, and at the Atlanta Airport, and online. I've received a Promise Award from VACNJ, and I explore environmental themes, and I tie them into an investigation of the likeness and frictions between my urban life and my folk art aesthetic. I share my expression of the landscape I see along with the intersections of consumerism and the rebirth of the mending movement and climate concerns. Scenes of the beach to the mountains from homes to the workshops are all connected by fibers produced, discarded, and reused. Some of them made it into their intended use and many were dis discarded upon creation. And those are the ones that I use to make my artwork. Thank you. Yeah. This, our next artist is Kat Chetty and this is Growth, the Growth Coat, 2023. It is a thrift store coat uh, augmented with thread, leather, vinyl, plastic gold spikes, a metal mask, and electronics. A person with short, dark hair wears a green coat with dark and light green fabric feathers at the lapels and collar. A green fabric feathered mask covers their face. Golden studs line the coat and hang down from the mask's eyes and mouth. In the last image, the coat is pulled down so that we can see the imprints the studs made on the model's bare back. Unfortunately, Kat could not be with us today. So I will be reading their state bio and statement about the art. Kat Chuddy, they, them, is a disabled queer American artist currently living and working in Florida. They have an extensive educational background in both art and science and seek to find the edge where the two disciplines meet and inform one another through the subject of their work, which is invisible disability. Chuddy is an advocate for disability rights, healthcare rights, and educational reform. About the art, this coat and the mask embody the idea of growth at its most basic, that it involves change that can be both beautiful and painful. This wearable embraces both aspects of that process and does not shy away from suffering, instead adorning the thorny underside with gold. 
please. Our next artist is Bronte Grimm. This is Wetted Vex, 2023. There's a multimedia photograph done of a mask in polymer clay with tack nails and metallic paint. The description of this work. It's a portrait of a pale-skinned trans woman with long auburn hair. Her blue eyes look upward and her hands with golden fingertips hold a gilded mask covered in tack nails to her face. The mask covers her mouth and most of her nose and a gold tear drops from her left eye. Bronte, would you like to join us and tell us about your work? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Bronte Grimm. I am an award-winning and nationally exhibited multidisciplinary artist and queer trans disability activist whose artwork focuses on discussing the intersection of domestic violence, disability, and queerness. I currently reside on Cowlitz land with an apocalypse-ready sized stash of green tea. <laughs> And my piece is, um, I'll just read the artist statement for it, the piece statement. Uh, Wedded Vex is the visual representation of my frustration and anger at the current pandemic response in the United States. Inspired by a medieval flail, which requires distance between two parties to be effective, I created a flail-like mask to act as a symbolic reminder that masks are not only necessary in protecting us from plague, but that we should be conscientious of ensuring safety for all by making masking mandatory in all indoor spaces and outdoor spaces where people are in close proximity. The gilding of the mask reminds the viewer that the person wearing a mask has intrinsic value. Refuting ableist beliefs that the immunocompromised, elderly and disabled are somehow less valuable and important than able people. Thank you so much. This is such a stunning work. Next artist is Rachel Gibson. This is Lazaretto number no. five, 2023. Rubber and metal pins over foam head. The next work is also by Rachel Gibson. That is Lazaretto number six. The description of both pieces, their front and side views of two black rubber full masks. Black rubber pieces are shingled over foam heads and held down with silver pins. On number five, there's a narrow black tire valve sticking out from the very top of the head, spikes coming out of the mouth and a loop at the back of the head. In number six, the tire valve extends from the tip of the nose, and there is a frill from ear to ear over the top of the head made from oval-shaped rubber pieces. The next slide is Lazaretto number six, also 2023, and you can see the frill over the top of the head almost looking like turkey feathers. So about the art, for the majority of the world, the notion of quarantine was something apart from modern life until 2020. Now that lockdown rules have been much loosened, how do we go back? How many of us find ourselves in a self-imposed quarantine? Have we developed a second skin? Do we now have an armor of sorts to keep us in a self-imposed quarantine socially, emotionally, and physically? Lazaretto is a diminutive form of the Italian word for beggar and refers to a place of quarantine. In the case of maritime travelers, a ship set adrift. And here we are. R.L. Gibson, Rachel, works as a mixed media artist with work in galleries from New York to Los Angeles and collections around the world. Her practice currently explores work that overlays watercolor with embroidery. The hand-stitched component of this work lends movement 
to otherwise still media while paying homage to the band of quilting women that she calls family. Our next artist is Samuel Goldstein. And this is the Mardi Gras Mask 2023. This is a GVS Ellipse P100 source control respirator. The KLIM Clarity Portable Voice Amplifier. Painted with acrylic paint and has some speaker wire. The description of this piece. The Mardi Gras mask is a high quality respirator decorated and modified to include a voice amplification system. The mask is decorated with golden fleur-de-lis and colorful patterns in purple and green. In the second picture, a man in a black tuxedo jacket wears the mask while standing on a beach boardwalk. He wears multiple Mardi Gras beads around his neck. About the art, Samuel says, over the past 20 years, I've been the photographer for the annual Venice Beach Mardi Gras parade. The parade was on hiatus during COVID, but resumed in 2023, despite COVID still being a problem. Furthermore, my partner has respiratory vulnerability, so if I were to attend and photograph the parade, special care would be needed. This Mardi Gras mask was my solution. And a brilliant solution, I might add. Samuel is a coder, photographer, writer, avant-garde theater hanger-on, reader, hiker, tech aficionado, typographer, and butterfly farmer. He's been the official, unofficial photographer of the Venice Beach Mardi Gras Parade since 2003. Our next artist is Ash Hegerstrand. This work is called Mistitled 2023. The straw hat and silk scarf, and it looks like a bunch of false flowers behind the ear. For the art description, the mask is created by attaching a floral pink and green scarf to a large floppy white straw hat. It is worn by a person with big brown eyes and brown hair, with a bunch of white flowers worn behind their left ear. Ash, would you like to come on and tell us? Yeah, Ash, everyone. Please, welcome. Thank you so much for bringing the, the mask and wearing it. Yeah, I thought... You know, it's why nice not? To see it in person. Hi, everyone. I'm Ash Hagerstrand. I'm a white and Asian non binary person with short brown hair, wearing a white shirt, and then my piece. I'm on the Nupi land. Uh, I'm an artist and curator working at the intersection of disability and technology. My work is a mask created by uh, attaching a floral print pink and green scarf to a large floppy white straw hat. The work is inspired by a widely circulated image that took the internet by storm in 2020. The image is a black and white vintage photograph of two women fashionably dressed with face mask attached to their large sun hats. The work was incorrectly captioned as having originated during the 1918 flu epidemic when face masks were used to prevent transmission. The image was actually taken five years earlier during the Balkan War and shows two, a, a widely uh, popular fashion trend inspired by Turkish veils. Though this fashion trend connects to a long history of facial coverings as cultural signifier, its popularity during the pandemic points towards how we re-examine and reconfigure, his, reconfigure history to comfort, perhaps with increased ease of distribution during the digital age. The floral print on the scarf references infamous, the infamous beaked Middle Age, Ages plague masks, which were stuffed with various flowers to ward off smells and decay of decay and miasma. It appears that only the only contemporary sources which claim witness to this infamous costume are actually based in Italy during the 17th century, and mostly in the realm of parody and theater and not medical texts, making it at best a child of the Renaissance medicine and more likely a reimagining of past plagues by our theatrical ancestors. I think that's so fascinating how <laughs> how we misrepresent history all the time and this isn't news that the yeah. the idea of fake news is very old yeah fake news is ancient
Thank you so much, Ash. Our next artist is David Isaacson, wearing the disinfectant collar, made in 2022. This is an assemblage of wire and disinfectant bottles. A man with gray hair and a gray beard wears a pink face mask, a gray shirt, and a collar made out of clear plastic containers of disinfectant strung all the way around his neck. The bottles have small amounts of clear or pale green disinfectant inside. In the background is a small sailing ship. David Isaacson is an emerging outsider artist who lives and works in 29 Palms, California. In 1996, coming back to the U.S. from Amsterdam, he built a workbench with recycled wood and got to creating. In 2012, he began to exhibit regularly. After winning prizes in juried art shows for his work, he developed his sense of deconstruction humor and continued to refine his assemblages. With over 120 shows and at least as many pieces of art to his credit, he is exhibited at BG Gallery in Brighamet Station, Santa Monica, California, the Sylvia White Gallery in Ventura, the LA Art Show, a solo show titled Relics of the Civilization of Myself at the Blackboard Gallery in Camarillo, on Ikui at Arts Unbound and in Opulent Mobility, as well as the Keck School of Medicine, among other places. His work is collected in the United States, and he is published internationally. The Statement About the Art This is a metal wire bent into a circle, but along the circular wire every three or so inches is a used plastic bottle with a pressed-down nozzle to dispense hand sanitizer. If C is circumference equals 2 pi radius, then the circumference is plus or minus 62 inches. He no longer has the objects to count, but imagines there are probably 20 containers of alcohol-based hand sanitizer, meaning about every three inches there is a plastic bottle wrapped to the wire. This creates a collar like an Elizabethan ruffle collar made of bottles. He used tons of sanitizer during the pandemic because it helped put his mind at ease. One of the things I love most about David's work is the beautiful sense of humor that it has. Just the odd uh, juxtaposition of different items and the visual puns that he makes. I've been working with him for a while and I'm so glad that he could be part of this show. Our next artist is Gwen Kennedy. The photograph is called Peeping from 2021. It's black and white layered photography. The description of this piece is a layered black and white photo of an eye tightly framed by the upper image of a rough old stone wall with a hole for the eye to peep through. The gossamer threads of a broken spider web are layered across the eye and twigs and moss lie around the edges. There's a beautiful spooky kind of feel. Gwen Kennedy, would you like to join us and tell us about yourself and your art? Hi, I'm Gwen and I live in Cork, Ireland and a lot of what I would do. I do in terms of art would be digital photography, particularly black and white. Um, and yeah, my passion for art basically reignited. Um, while reimagining day to day life after a period, after, and we living with after. Sorry, let me back to there. <laughs> life after, and with chronic pain. And that's who I am. Welcome. 
And you said that this is a part of a wider first thing in the morning layered series of self-portraits that were made during uh, COVID-19 isolation. Yeah. What this made you think of that? Um, I think initially just I was living on my own at the time and just living on my own with maybe interaction with one other person physically in meet up a friend very odd time who was also living alone um, and just there's something about just feeling the need to kind of mark time and wanting to have something that I could say I had done something every day if you know what I mean just to give a sense of purpose to the day to day um, and yeah and I took I took that series of photos for about two or three months around that time this particular one I actually was isolating self-isolating because I actually had COVID when I took this photo so it added an extra dimension to it and the the wall that's the photo that's the stone wall that's in the photo is a is a wall from the from an old workhouse from famine times. So it just had a bit of a play, bit of a um, health over health kind of joined up thinking. Um, and also with that series, I let. For some of them, I layered like photography. I layered um, poems and and lyrics of songs with the photographs. Oh, this how neat! Really clear. Yeah, it was fun. It's like, how do you enter? How do you entertain yourself when there's nobody around and nothing happening, basically? So, yeah. Excellent and, use of time then. Well, I try. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was really taken by this. It's just such a striking image. I appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Our next artist is Austin Lubetkin. This is Portrait of Mother 2023, print on canvas. The description is a portrait of a pale-skinned woman with swirling rainbow-colored hair, aqua eyes, and a rainbow mask covering her nose, mouth, and chin. The rainbow hair is covered in small circles and ovals in contrasting colors. And below the neck, the colors flatten and shimmer like water and reflections on water. About the art, Austin says, this piece originally started as a portrait of my mother who has experienced multiple chronic illnesses and is immunocompromised. I tried to create a piece that used rainbow flowing elements, almost like bacteria in the air and a rainbow face mask. About the artist, Austin Lubetkin is a software engineer and an artist on the autism spectrum based out of Los Angeles, California. The artist's work uses bright, vibrant rainbow colors to express life, emotion, and energy. His colors originate from his synesthesia, where he sees his emotions as colors. Austin's work combines a mixture of his own painting and AI prompts and multimedia. So it's interesting to have somebody using their own art as an AI prompt. Our next artist is Noel Malloy. Oops. This is the outdoor Osmeridium protective suit from 2016, made out of found objects. It's a wonderful robot-like appearance. Describing the art. 
It is a life-sized wall relief sculpture created from various shades of blue and gray plastic found objects, such as a foot spa, an electric heater casing, a shower and sound speaker components to simulate an all over body suit with a face shield and breathing apparatus. In the center of his chest is a pale purple label reading, oops. I love that you can see the buttons. Okay. Yeah, I am a 60 odd year old uh, white male with grayish, graying brown hair and white beard wearing uh, reading glasses uh, in, a green, in a green jumper. I am a multidisciplinary artist who has been working in the arts for over 40 years. Um, I work in sculpture, um, uh, found objects, uh, junk, and um, performance art, um, film, and uh, sound. I have exhibited internationally and nationally in galleries, in uh, performance festivals, in, uh, at symposiums, and at various film festivals. Um, that's basically it. I live and uh, work in Roscommon, Ireland, which is in the Midlands of the island of Ireland. And about this sculpture? Oh yeah, do you want me to read a piece I, 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 about the artwork piece? Sure. On screen? Yeah, the sculpture Oops and the name Oops came to me originally as a sort of fun thing, as in Oops, here we go again. Uh, and I, I trawled uh, the internet to find out what uh, uh, the name of a metal beginning with O. And I found Osmeridium. Osmeridium is a a metal, a very hard metal that is uh, used in the production of pen nibs. So I, I envisaged this suit after out, outdoor arts meridian protective suit after, around the time in 2016 when there was a surge in viruses uh, such as Ebola and Zika and there was terrorist attacks, both from governments and rebels. There was disasters, uh, read the climate change. Uh, countries, cities were uh, talking about poor quality air and water and the lack of thereof in uh, continents like Africa. So I envisaged uh, that as things develop or uh, get worse, in other, in other words, that there would come a day when we would need to wear a suit to venture outdoors. Like we, we've growing up, grown up with the, the uh, situation where we get warnings uh, via uh, radio and that sort of thing about the temperatures and about burning and about uh, wearing sunblock and all this sort of thing. And it was like something when I was a child, we didn't have that. We didn't, it, there wasn't any of that, whether it was just ignorance or whether it was just uh, no knowledge of what the damage and that sort of thing. But as things progressed, and I saw this and I, I sort of en envisaged that with the way uh, people were discussing these things and the spread of, uh, of these viruses, uh, that we were lucky at that stage that we didn't have a pandemic like we have had with COVID. And it's like, this came to me in a sense that it was like a premonition that it, it, it was going to happen. Someday it was going to happen. And, and you know, this, this, the idea of the suit came to me. So I still think that as we progress and as, as governments and uh, um, international corporations, etc., get more and more greedy for profit and land, that uh, we will eventually end up in the situation where 
I know I may not be alive when it happens, but my children and grandchildren will be. And this is, yeah, this is why I, 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 I create these works that uh, talk about the damage to the environment, the, the social injustice of it all, because it's usually a, a maybe a third world country or a second world country or whatever that all of this damage is being done to. So people are living in toxic dumps, in, in toxic atmospheres and all of this, and purely down to uh, the, the need for the dollar and power. So I this is what I do. I continue to work and use uh, junk found objects in all, uh, all uh, across the range of work and mediums that I work in. And I hope I hope that it, it, it brings home some sort of a message and gets people to think about their surroundings, their environment, and just by looking at the work and, and, and what's involved. It's one of the things I love most about your work, how thoughtful it is. And also, even when you're talking about things that really are despairing, there's yes. a sense of humor and joy in it, and that and I the, believe humor to be a a, a, a healing, a, a, you know, creates a healing process, and and uh, uh, this is why I use it a lot in my work, and you know, I I um, and I'm happy and, and I enjoy the fact that children can see this, and when I used to do workshops with children uh, uh, using uh, junk material and that sort of thing, they looked, they began, they, be, they become to look at the, the junk and the whatever uh, uh, found objects they're using in a different light. Yeah. They don't, they don't see it and they start to think about uh, what this is, what this object is, and and how necessary it is, and all of that, and and I hope that has created a, a, a thinking for their future. In that they will consider: Do I need that plastic? Do I need that uh, disposable? Whatever. You know, so it's just that hopefully it has made some impact on people that they can consider what what both they're discarding and what what uh, effect they're having on their environment. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. Next up. The artist is Penny Richards with Hat Traditions on Warfield in the Quarantine Years from 2023 in Mixed Fibers. And Penny has come up with an entire array for us of different hats, five different hats with full detailed descriptions of them and their ethnography. So this is as though they were unearthed by future uh, archeologists trying to find out the history of what happened to these people during this time. So the ethnographic reports on Warfield Island, appendix number three, hat traditions on Warfield in the quarantine years by Penny Richards. Warfield Island, not its real name, is a small island which has declared itself to be under quarantine, not because of any illness in the inhabitants, but to protect themselves from a pandemic in the outside world. The resulting isolation, including limited access to outside goods, has resulted in some specific adaptions of the island's culture. In this appendix, several examples of this island's material culture are discussed, specifically the unusual hats worn by the inhabitants. Please note, Warfield hats are prized by some collectors and have become somewhat known beyond the island. However, our team proposes that some of the reported ancient folklore surrounding these objects 
as collected in oral histories and reproduced here, is probably intentionally fictional, created to entertain the teller while mocking the interviewer. Readers of this report should proceed with caution, understanding that the Warfield hat makers enjoy a prank-based storytelling practice. Warfield hats, figure one, the weighty fez. The materials are black jersey scripts, or tea yarn, green bulky wool in knit packs oregano colorway, a madras shirt samples and small beads with a barrette. The construction method is crocheted and hand-sewn embellishment. It is a startling heavy, startlingly heavy object, which must be worn with some care since it is oversized and will crush the wearer's ears, ouch, if it is not placed and balanced correctly. It is worn to uh, convey the solemn authority of the island's leadership and requires the wearer to move with an attitude of grave thoughtfulness. This visual impression is sometimes enhanced with a long black coat, cloak, reminiscent of priestly or judicial garments. The fez may also be used as a container, although this function has not been yet studied in detail. Mmm. Figure two. The potato cloche. Let us wait till our model. Ah, tries on the potato cloche. The materials are four felted sweaters in wool, cashmere, and angora, an elastic band, button, and thread. The construction method is hand sewn. Uh, the pattern may be loosely based from the basic cloche in Eugenia Kim's Saturday Night Hat from 2006 a copy of which is in the island's archive, now demonstrated. This is another oversight piece which is intended to protect the wearer's eyes and ears from too much light or noise, like a potato in the earth, according to one hat maker. It is reversible with one side somewhat softer than the other. This allows the wearer to choose which texture will be more suitable in whatever given mood. Aha. The brown ovals and the black panels may literally reference potatoes, which is a staple food of the Warfield cuisine. And our next hat is the magpie's helmet. The materials are wool from Rowan, chunky print and Fleischer's spice and salt and pepper, which is a vintage 1970s piece. Cotton crocheted thread, a strip of black jersey, a length of gold embroidered fabric ribbon, many found metal objects, including charms, earrings, beads, and machine parts. Contracts, the construction method is crochet and applique. Warfields, Warfielders prize small but worthless tokens, such as beads, keys, and broken jewelry. Traditionally, women wear the tokens of their foremothers on William Helmet woolen helmet shaped caps. They believe these tokens invite ancestral protection and power. An old woman will often distribute her tokens to loved ones with stories and songs. It is considered a great compliment to say that someone died with her cap bare because it indicates the person has dispensed all of their wisdom, shared their lore and faced the unknown bravely. Nice. In figure four, we see the dye test quaif. This one, the materials are cotton, jersey scrap fabrics, thread, vintage button, lace, and beads. The construction method is sewn, appliqued, embroidered, and with red and purple dyes. A Warfield dye test quaif is a simple layer tied, two layer dyed, excuse me. A Warfield dye test quaif is a simple two-layer tied cloth cap. Its interest comes from its finishing process. Island crafters use scraps of national natural woolen uh, woven fabrics and fibers to make the caps, then dye them and wear the results, both to record their dye experiments for future reference and to display their adventurous spirit, because dyeing is always an adventure. Oh yeah. In Warfield lore, a dye test quaif is a common metaphor for community strength because the diverse components bear evidence of an intense shared history together. 
And then our last example is the list bucket hat. Materials are scrap fabrics, including denim and bridal crepe, lace, printable sheets, thread, vintage buttons, elastic, wood, a pin back, Mod Podge, paint and paper collage. The construction method is sewn, printed, and appliqued based on a pattern by, I can't even begin to pronounce this. No, but <laughs> that's, that's okay. It's based on a Japanese pattern from Soinju Buku or Sewing Book, a Japanese magazine. This hat's existence may be based on mishearing or mistranslation. Here's the pattern, nice, of the phrase bucket list. A simple line denim bucket hat is embellished with two lists on the band and as a pinned embellishment. The band lists the name of women and the pinned list seems to be ordinary social activities. These lists may recall past or lost events and people. The quarantine culture of Warfield Island has turned many objects into sites of memory and mourning. So just an overall description of all of these hats. Is it there are five handmade hats with faux ethnographic descriptions. Two are sewn from various fabrics, two are crocheted, and one is made from felted wool sweaters. Most of them include other embellishments like applique, beads, buttons, ribbons, and etc. Penny, would you like to tell us about this amazing array of hats you've created <laughs> and the story behind them? I Sure, I'd be happy to. I am a white woman in her 50s uh, with dark hair in braids, wearing glasses and a green blouse. I'm sitting in front of my hats, which are set up behind me on little foam heads. I made these originally for the Fun A Day Los Angeles event that Amy Bauer, an earlier artist in this, um, hosted in Long Beach. And every year for Fun A Day, I make a, a bunch of stuff. And this year I started, I decided to make hats and the hats started telling me stories. And that's really weird because I don't write fiction at all, <laughs> but they kept, they kept telling me stories like this. And so it, it eventually developed into, um, developed into a brochure for the, for the show which has uh, all the all the pieces and, and a description and it's, you know, that was fun to make. And then I made it into a book also for um, to show off afterwards when it's all over. Um, but anyway, it they just kept happening. Um, I do wear all these hats. I have worn all of these hats out of my house on walks in the neighborhood. Um, some of them I wear more often than others, but I do wear them. <laughs> They're all made from stuff around my house, which is what I do every year for fun a day. Um, and um, I keep it keeps happening. So there's actually more hats than this now in the collection. But um, they're they do they do want to tell me something about where we are and what we're doing in in, in our time right now. That's really pretty amazing. I'm I'm just so impressed with with the sheer quantity. But I also understand sometimes art tells you it needs to be made. Yeah, exactly. That is fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next artist is Christine Yelich Roberts. The Plague Thieves masks from 2023. They're made from paper mache, acrylic paint, and silk flowers. Describing these pieces, there are two eye masks with elongated noses one of them is painted gold and blue and the other one red and gold. The blue one has a nose with a beak upturned at the tip and the red nosed one curves downwards. Both masks have fabric flowers at the center of the forehead. And Christine, would you like to come on and tell us about these wonderful masks, what they mean and a little bit about yourself? Thank you for including me in the show. I'm delighted to be here. I've always been fascinated by the bubonic plague since I was ever heard about it as a little girl. Years ago, I did some research about women healers as mid and midwives as witches and came across the story of the plague thieves. Um, as a synesthetic obsessed with patterns and colors, I've been a mixed media collector of found objects and makers since I was about five. I would 
walk the streets of Los Angeles uh, with my grandfather almost every night after dinner, all through Chinatown and Elysian Park and downtown LA, and collect little things and come home and empty out my pockets of all these little curiosities and put them together and, and make things. And my family was always so supportive of giving me supplies ever since I was little. Um, I spent some of my life as a chiropractic and birth coach and as a part-time here and there, and I can spend more time making things, which I love. Um, I love working with Mexican classical paper mache and I've studied with um, a paper mache artist, uh, Joel Garcia, whose sister married a Linares when he was 10. The Linares family are the classical, most well-known paper mache artist in, in Mexico. Yeah. So I use these very old Mexican techniques and make things. Um, I'm also part of the Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos community in Los Angeles and exhibit it shows and mostly sell things that I make, all sorts of um, muertos ephemera. I'm in Olvera Street and other shows. And my favorite is making masks. So a few years ago, I created this whole little plague doctor mask series and was so happy that I could put them in the show today. Um, all this bubonic plague that I've kind of been obsessed with since I was little. And then my father got San Joaquin Valley fever when I was about four or five also. So viruses have always been, uh, and randomly getting these weird diseases, always been fascination of mine. Little did we know that we would be living through our own time. Um, I closed a classroom that I was long-term subbing in uh, on March 13th, 2020. And then my eldest child came down with COVID about four days later. I rushed down to downtown LA. He lives on my family property in Chinatown. Uh, brought him home. And I was so grateful that I had skills of herbs and homo homeopathy. And remember the curandera who lived up the street from us in Chinatown prayed to my grandmother and my tia who would always rub so many bizarre odd things all over my body when I was little and do things old school healing and was vigilant for about a solid 25 30 hours with my son and he got through the worst of it in very very well in the very beginning those very beginning days of COVID was was so very frightening and there was no way I was going to take him to a hospital and leave him so when he got well after about three weeks of sleeping practically around the clock, we went down, picked up a sewing machine. <laughs> the two of us probably made about 2,000 cloth masks that we sold and gave away and supported ourselves till unemployment started. So um, we looked, we, we remembered these masks and put them up on the wall of our little sewing sweatshop that we had created as inspiration. So um, thank you so much for letting me be in the show and add these had these kind of ancient interpretations of uh, of safety masks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this. I really appreciate it. And I love the story. Um, <laughs> that must have been a terrifying time for you. It, it, it was quite hideous. Uh, at one point, I leaned him, I, le I dragged him up and lent him over, bent him over a, a lower chair with pillows so I could have his back and he would just cough, just couldn't. He's been bronchial since he was about 18 months. So we already had a lot of tools of, of natural things. And of course he's inhaler, but natural things that pull him out um, when he's bad. And I just would pound on him with oils. I had like three vaporizers with this thieves formula. There's actually a, a formula called thieves, ironically, that is antiviral and protective. Um, and I would just pound on his back as long as I could and then go lay down and set a timer for about 20 minutes and wake up. And about the fourth or fifth time that I woke up, um, I didn't hear him coughing and I heard, I just freaked out and ran to, to the living room. And there he had gotten himself up and was sleeping. And this grown 35 year old man did not even get up to pee for about two days. He just slept straight through and I was just constantly vigilant watching, making sure he was still breathing. And um, that was the worst of it. So yes, me too. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for both of you for putting this on and doing this. I can't wait to see the finished product.
Thanks. This is awesome. Thank you. Our next artist is Johanna Sigmund. The piece is Talismans from 2023. It is digital art. The description is an elegant woman in profile, sporting her black hair in a tight bun and wearing an enormous and elaborate laced collar necklace. Curved umbrella rib extensions extend from the lace choker and surround her entire body, extending far past her shoulders. The tip of each of these umbrella ribs is festooned in alternating talismans of evil eyes and garlic bulbs. The entire image is in high contrast with minimal color, primarily black and white. So about this art piece, it's a Victorian style collar for protection from vampires and evil spirits. During turbulent times, the human spirit seeks to normalize the terrifying, the threatening, and the unknown. Often this is done with attire and accessories. Talismans is one way that people can stay safe as they social distance in style, while simultaneously warding off evil spirits. It's also a fun idea that you have something, if you were genuinely to wear this, something that would peculiarly keep people at arm's length. Unfortunately, Nona can't be with us, but she's given us her bio. Johanna is primarily a portrait photographer who specializes in creative portraits of people with their pets. Her recently published book, In Good Company, which is notable people with their pets, is available globally from any online bookseller and can be ordered from any bookstore. I met Johanna when we were in the middle of lockdown and we did a socially distant photo shoot through Zoom. So another great way that we can connect and keep sharing our art when we are physically separate from each other. Our next artist and last artist for today is Misty Athena Stokes. It's Vizard, a Vizard, I'm not sure, from 2023, and it's a mixed media mask. The description of this piece it is a long-nosed, big-eyed animal mask. It's an animal head made of brightly colored long rectangles and circles in red, yellow, green, and pink. The mask has a crown of long, thin rectangles and triangles, and the long rectangular snout ends in two red button nostrils. Misty, would you like to come on and tell us a bit about your piece and about yourself? Hello, hi. Um, I'm, so I'm Misty Athena Stokes um, and I'm a mixed media artist from Luton, UK. Um, for the visual description, I'm a white lady in her thirties. I have green eyes and long brown hair. I'm wearing eyeliner and red lipstick and a black t-shirt with gold earrings and necklace. So I'm inspired by many different artistic styles. I'm particularly interested in geometric shapes, the patterns used in other cultures and surrealist art. Much of my artwork has an underlying theme relating to mental and physical health and not being defined by illness. Um, I have exhibited my work internationally in the US, China and France and in many cities across the UK for exhibitions such as Opulent Mobility and Big Screen Plaza in the US and the Design Museum in the UK. Uh, my piece, Vizard, means a mask or a disguise. And I was particularly interested in creating an ostentatious mask using everyday materials like cardboard, um, which is what I used to create this piece. Um, cardboard is readily, readily available regardless of your social status, so I wanted to turn trash into treasure. So I found out about uh, the Plague Wear Gala via Laura, who sent me the information, and I thought the concept of the gala was a fantastic idea. 
Um, why shouldn't masks for pandemics and plagues be boring? They should be fabulous. So I felt that some people use masks for protection or to hide from the world, but I wanted to make a statement piece which was inspired by different cultures and looked opulent and surreal. It's really quite fabulous. One of the things I really enjoy about your art, because uh, Misty has been in two of the opulent mobility exhibits that I've curated, as well as this, is that they're high graphic style and really such a loving sense of adventure about them. Yeah, I really wanted to kind of not be defined by illnesses and limitations and to say we may have um, these illnesses but we don't have to be defined by them we can stand out as individuals with rich inner worlds so that's what I really wanted to get across here and I thought that being able to wear something like that would be fabulous in the street. Thank you so much for sharing your inner world with us. Thank you very much for including me. You can find all of the artists in the Playground Gala through either their websites or through their Instagram accounts. Take a look at them here. You can also look at the link in the description where all of them will be listed. Thanks so much for being part of the Plague Wear Gala 2023. It was curated by me, A. Laura Brody of Opulent Mobility, directed by Diana Elizabeth Jordan, and American Sign Language Interpretation by Pro Bono ASL. Thank you so much, Christina and Alina. Many thanks to all of the artists for sharing their work, uh, to the New Motion Foundation for their generous support, and to the Genius Tea Time supporters who help make ASL interpretation possible. You can find out more at opulentmobility.com. That information will also be in the description. In conclusion with all of this, we can expect even more pandemics in our future because of climate change, because of the situations that we are in in the world today. Let's see if we can face them with care and consideration and style. Thank you. <laughs>